The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Chris Spanos, coming up on the show. Google is the world's information behemoth. WikiLeaks, the world's most famous insurgent publisher. When Google met WikiLeaks is Julian Assange's new book. The book tells the story of how Google chairman Eric Schmidt and Julian Assange met and debated technology in society. The book presents two radically opposing visions for the internet and world. Julian Assange is founder and editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks. He joins me from the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Hi, Julian. Welcome to Imaginary Lines. Good evening, Quito. First of all, Julian, why did Google want to meet with you? That's a very interesting question. Uh, it is still not known for sure why Google wanted to meet with me. Uh, the pretext uh, for the meeting was Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, together with Jared Cohen, um, someone was hired for Google to set up a sort of mini State Department within Google called Google Ideas, who had immediately worked for Hillary, um, producing a new book uh, called uh, The New Digital Age. And that was to be Google's vision for the future of the world, uh, the future of nations, uh, peoples, and information. And they wanted to interview me uh, as part of that. Uh, and that's more or less what we thought it probably was, other than Google trying to pump me for strategic information that it might use in terms of how it would lay out its business over the next 10 years. Uh, but afterwards, uh, it was clear that something else was going on. You describe Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen as perfectly likable people, but you write that people all over the world should be concerned if the future of the internet is to be Google. Why should people be concerned? You know, people have often said that Barack Obama is a perfectly likable person. I believe that's probably true. It's actually quite hard to get to the top of politics or to be a billionaire um, if you're not personable and don't make friends easy or put people at ease. Uh, but it's not about that interpersonal nature. It's about the, the structure which these people embedded with uh, and what their plans are uh, and what their ideological ideas are and who their allies are. Uh, in the case of Google, we have two things happening at once. On the one hand, we have now what is the second largest company in the United States, $400 billion market capitalization, which has doubled uh, in size since 2011 which has moved its operations into every single part of the world. Uh, more than 1.5 million people per day enter into the Google system uh, just as a result of buying new smartphones. That's an increase of 1.5 million per day. More than the population of the United States every year is entering into that system. Um, and of course, uh, they collect information uh, from everyone who uses uh, Android uh, telephones, Google search, YouTube, uh, various forms of mail, and other um, industries that they control. And unlike a normal big corporation which has many different interests, um, it pulls together all this information collection. It's not like it has a YouTube estate here, and Google search there, and Android here. It pulls together all this information, couples it together for each person that they detect, and builds a uh, profile of that person and it collects their history. Uh, and that is its business model. Being a private, uh, lawful version of the National Security Agency, creating free services, seemingly free services, that act as bait uh, to bring in the world's population, to use those services, to give the private information to Google, which Google then stores, indexes, and creates profiles of interest uh, for each person, uh, which it then uses to sell to uh, advertisers uh, uh, and uh, at a political level, um, the National Security Agency uh, then couples on top. It doesn't need to collect all that information uh, itself because Google collects it all, brings it back to the United States and the National Security Agency uh, then 
uh, intercepts that information either within Google or as it goes to Google or using this uh, PRISM system uh, which couples uh, to Google itself. You write that Google's influence on the choices and behavior of the totality of individual human beings translates to real power to influence the course of history. What does a Google future for the world look like? Well, Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, and Jared Cohen, the uh, director of Google Ideas, Google's think tank about how to deal with the world, um, have documented it. They documented the new digital age and also another article they wrote called The Empire of the Mind um, that states who were involved in coalitions of their militaries in Iraq can come together with coalitions of the connected uh, and uh, essentially, uh, they don't put it in these terms, but uh, push forward American exceptionalism and um, centrist um, liberalism as sort of defined, I guess, by Hillary Clinton uh, push that into the world. And they see that as a very good vision for the world. They see that they, um, that they believe that uh, the mass invasion of privacy uh, under Western governments is fine because it just allows Western governments to manage their people better and manage the society better and be more responsive to the needs of the people. Uh, but the, exactly the same mass invasion uh, of people's privacy with other governments is something, um, something that is bad. And in, in some ways, it's a banal vision. It's, it's not a, a really politically sophisticated vision or culturally sophisticated vision. Uh, but that is what the people there within that center of American exceptionalism that revolves around uh, the New America Foundation and uh, Google and some of the uh, expensive think tanks uh, in California. Uh, it is a sort of uh, banal culturally insensitive view that American exceptionalism is a good thing and it's just trying to arrange the world uh, to be uh, more liberal uh, and to bring them into the US industrial system because that's what everyone wants. There's a myth in advanced capitalist countries about civil society being a space where people come together free from political influence and manipulation. Google has managed to project an image of corporate responsibility into this space. What role has Google played in civil society? Google, through Google Ideas and a number of other funding arrangements, um, has funded a lot of the high-tech civil society. So those very organizations, which would be scrutinizing Google's activity on the internet, complaining about it's ever expanding industrial uh, private surveillance cone, um, those very organizations it is funding. And as a result, I think we, we don't see proper uh, critical analysis by those organizations. Uh, similarly, every year, uh, Google Ideas runs a private invitation only conference that really mirrors something that the State Department has been doing uh, since the early 70s, the IVP program, or International Visitor Program, whereas it was renamed International Leadership Program. In fact, you can search WikiLeaks for IVP or IVLP, and you will see um, that it goes after young people that they believe will enter into political leadership, perhaps will enter into political leadership or business leadership one day, bring them together with senior people in the United States government uh, and industry and sort of network them into the fold. And that's true, for example, for Sweden's foreign minister, Carl Bildt. That's been true for a number of the British prime ministers, Australian prime ministers. Uh, over 340 uh, global leaders actually were part of that program. So Google has its own version of that that it runs every year. And it brings in uh, activists, some genuine activists from um, around the world in countries that are at odds with US foreign policy agendas, pulls them together and gets them to meet US generals uh, and cybersecurity chieftains uh, and uh, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen and uh, other Google staff. Um, and together they create a, um, a matrix or a, a patronage web uh, through which um, well, certainly US foreign policy agendas, uh, which are co-aligned between Google and the State Department are better able to be executed 
um, but also with which Google itself as an institution um, is able to uh, have influence with various uh, players geopolitically. I would like to read a few lines from Schmidt and Cohen's book, The New Digital Age, to get your reaction. They write, quote, authoritarian regimes will put up a vicious fight. They will leverage the permanence of information and their control over mobile and internet service providers to create an environment of heightened vulnerability for their citizens. What little privacy existed before will be long gone because the handsets that citizens have with them at all times will double as the surveillance bugs regimes have long wished they could put in people's homes." Unquote. How is it possible, Julian, that they could describe a vision of future authoritarianism but be oblivious or not realize that people would see it, that they're actually describing their own role in the world today? I know, it's, it's that blinkered American exceptionalism that simply can't, it's an extraordinary thing that simply has no ability to self-reflect. That what they are describing, of course, uh, is the most expansive, aggressive surveillance state that we have, which is the Five Eyes Alliance, uh, the National Security Agency in the United States, the big, the elephant in the room, and then the smaller players, uh, GCHQ and similar institutions in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. Um, uh, and Google's role in powering handsets, 80% of the smartphones now sold, uh, run by Google, uh, even if it's another brand on the phone, the insides are run by Google. Every search goes back, back to Google. Uh, the contacts go back, are stored in Google. The emails uh, go back to Google. The location, location information of where each person is goes to Google. The names of the wireless networks that are around them are collected by the phones and go back to Google. Uh, so it's a, a remarkable thing. But they, they try and excuse this phenomenon by saying, as I said before, that uh, if a Western government does it, it's okay because they're just going to measure more about their population and therefore have more information to respond to its needs. Uh, now, that's an interesting... That could be true. I mean, in theory, there could be a situation where that could be true, that a government collecting lots of information, if it was a highly responsive democratic government uh, whose abuses were all uncovered immediately, uh, maybe that would actually be a true situation. But um, we know, as a matter of empirical practice, um, that the United States government doesn't operate like that. We know because every Tuesday it has an extrajudicial assassination meeting uh, in the White House with Barack Obama signing off who is to live and who is to die without any uh, court process. We know as a result of the extensive unlawful activity, uh, breaking a law conducted by the National Security National Security Agency, and of course the various abuses by the justice system, uh, as even seen um, in the case of, of WikiLeaks and the US government trying to crack down on publishers. So we know that um, we don't have that uh, responsive government that would simply innocently look over all this information that has been collected uh, and use it to respond uh, in a humane way uh, to its citizenry. At this point, I'd like to ask you about this curious cable behind you, Julian. What is the significance of this document? Well, this cable behind me, <coughs> um, which you can find by uh, searching the net, Googling even, uh, for WikiLeaks NATO head. Uh, this cable is um, how the current NATO head, Remusen, got his job. Now, you might think, well, why, why is that interesting? Well, this cable has everything. Um, it has the Kurds. It has the destruction of an entire TV station. Uh, uh, corrupt deals between intelligence agencies and the judiciary. Uh, the corruption of a Scandinavian country, Denmark. Uh, and the head of that country, um, the prime minister, doing a corrupt deal to get his job. Uh, and the whole thing signed off by, explicitly, by Barack Obama, the whole deal. And so, uh, to make a, a long and very interesting story short, um, uh, Turkey has a veto on who would become the next, has a veto on who becomes the next head of NATO. 
uh, and when the current head was going to be the next head of NATO, uh, he was the Danish Prime Minister. And operating out of Denmark is the largest Kurdish TV station, Kurdish language TV station. And of course it can't operate out of Turkey because of the Turkish crackdown on the Kurds. So they operate out of Denmark, beam their satellite signal up, it gets broadcast down by Eurosat and people in Kurdistan and in Turkey are able to watch it. Very important uh, to have a national language broadcaster. Um, but that had infuriated the Kurds over many years and so they had been making constant complaints to Denmark saying, oh, they're too critical, they're too biased, we think they're promoting terrorism, etc. So the Danish, in response, formally investigated it twice and found no, it was doing just the same as all other new news stations. They couldn't find any connection with the PKK and it wasn't promoting violence. Uh, but, so what to do now? Um, well, uh, the then Danish Prime Minister, uh, as a part of a deal with Obama and Turkey, that he would have the NATO leadership, uh, got the, um, the Danish, uh, judiciary, Danish prosecuting authority and the Danish intelligence uh, to work out how to crush this TV station and take it down. And they're going to try all different methods and use creative tax investigations, even uses that word creative uh, in the cable, uh, to work out how to smash it. Uh, and eventually, Ramusin was given the job TV station was destroyed uh, and this year that whole case taken by the TV station against that activity is before the European courts for European Court of Human Rights uh, and this cable is the star exhibit in that case. You describe Google as a don't be evil empire but you write that it's still an empire. This term is traditionally applied to nations and states. How is Google an empire? Well, that phrase, evil empire, was introduced by Reagan in the 1980s to describe the Soviet empire. Uh, but of course, encoded within that is that the other empire is not an evil empire. That the US empire is a don't be evil empire. And that, that phrase of uh, don't be evil uh, was adopted by Google and promoted by Google um, in terms of its, how it was going to do things. Um, and it was used quite effectively to lull people into a false sense uh, that Google was a different type of company. Uh, combined with its basic business model of creating a free services trap. So if your email is free, just give it all to us. Uh, this web search is free, just tell us all the things that you're searching for. Um, permitted a perception uh, that Google was not like a normal for-profit company, that it was not a great big um, U.S. institution that has all this, the same problems as uh, companies like Coca-Cola or, or Lockheed Martin or Raytheon. Uh, and in fact, in the very beginning of Google, perhaps that was true uh, when it was a small startup in California. But as it got very large, uh, like many companies, it also entered into relationship with the state. It needed that relationship in order to pursue its foreign markets and so on. Uh, and it now has involvements in every single country in the world, uh, perhaps other than North Korea. And um, the result of that, it, you know, it's the second largest company in the United States. Uh, it deals with billions of people every day, collecting information of billions of people every day. Uh, Google is uh, an empire. And there's a question about what are the relationships of that empire? Who's it, who's it allied to? What, it's, what is its ideological position? What is its basic business model? Its basic business model is the same as the National Security Agency. Collect the world's information, store it, index it, uh, and work out how to predict people based on that. That's its basic business model. It can't change from that. Um, its basic political alignments uh, are reflected by the business deals it has with the US government. Its definition as being part of the formerly part of the U.S. defense industrial base uh, and the ideological uh, views of its executive leadership, which are documented in the book, which can simply be described as, as you know, um, uh, American uh, centrist, um, aggressive American exceptionalism. The Union of South American Nations, UNISUR, has proposed a digital ring to electronically consolidate 12 Latin American countries and including the BRICS countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. 
What do you think of this project as a counter to the Google empire? In the last 200 years, we have seen three great games. The first great game was for control of Central Asia and principally uh, Russia and um, the United Kingdom battled out uh, for domination of these Central Asian states. Uh, the second great game, uh, which has occurred in this century, has been the great game for the control of oil pipelines, where they transit through, where the oil is coming from, and so on. And we can see that uh, playing out right now uh, in terms of uh, Ukraine, uh, for example, or uh, uh, Libya, versus, uh, Libya versus Syria versus Qatar, and the oil pipelines uh, coming up and down to Russia there. And the third great game is the great game for control over the telecommunications between one continent and another, or one great population region and another. Uh, because if you can turn that off, you can destroy a whole economy. It all, its ability to access information, to communicate with the rest of the world, to plan trades, to conduct electronic fund, uh, funds transfers, uh, and various other forms of payments is all destroyed. Or, if you're able to intercept it all, uh, then you can understand and uh, uh, work out uh, how to outmaneuver um, uh, entire groups of nations or economic developments within those nations. And that is sort of reflected, for example, by the National Security Agency spying on the Brazilian company, oil company Petrobras, uh, and a number of other companies, the Swedes spying on Gazprom, etc. Um, so uh, it's very important that UNOSOR have a fiber optic cable ring uh, that connects the uh, Southern American uh, countries together. Uh, so it can't be cut off if there's a, a significant conflict with the United States because presently 98% of South American communications flow through the United States on the, to the rest of the world. They're intercepted there by the National Security Agency, but also if push comes to shove, the US can simply disconnect Latin America from the rest of the world. And that's a very serious leverage the United States has over Latin America. So it should at least be able to have intercommunication uh, with, it, with itself to try and resist that. Uh, and that will also help to some degree uh, with the interception problems. In your conversation with Schmidt and Cohen, you discuss the architecture of WikiLeaks technological platform and also the digital currency Bitcoin. Through this, readers are able to get an outline of your vision for the internet. Tell me more about your vision. Something very significant has happened with Bitcoin. It is the most intellectually interesting innovation that I have seen uh, in the past five years on the internet. And it's not for the reason that most people think, uh, that it's an international uh, currency that can't easily be blocked by states. That is very important. But the building blocks of that can lead to a great many different uh, uh, new innovations. Uh, and so the essential building block uh, is proof of publishing at a particular time, in a particular place, in a way that cannot be altered. Um, and the way this is used in Bitcoin uh, is every transaction in Bitcoin is um, recorded uh, and that is, is published. So if I give you a transaction, that's recorded. Uh, and it means that I can't give that same coin to someone else because everyone can look up in this global ledger of all the transactions and see that you have this coin now, not me anymore. And therefore, I can't spend it twice. Uh, and therefore, people can be confident that they're not going to be ripped off uh, in the process of this transaction. But what that means is that there has to be a global consensus uh, comp uh, a global uh, consensus, unalterable, uh, about what actually happened. And that global consensus mechanism, uh, locked down as a result of there being so many computers in so many different jurisdictions, means that history can be protected. So Orwell's dictum, if you remember, going back to 1984, is he who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. It's, it's actually very deep. So let's just unpack it a bit. 
if you control the present, you can control all the libraries, the internet servers, uh, and so on. Uh, and any piece of history that is stored is stored somewhere in the present, uh, and you can go in and change it. So you can change who has what money, uh, who, who, who owns what land, because there's land re registers and so on, or what happened in a war. All these things you can change if you control the present. Uh, and that is done uh, in different ways. Um, and if you control the present, you can control everyone's perception about the present. And with that, you can control the future. Um, so Bitcoin has a, a mechanism that it evolved, uh, it will, that it innovated to deal with this problem of double spending. Uh, but the same mechanism um, can be used for international agreements of lots of people. It can be used for digital voting, a completely accurate record of who voted for what, for when, that cannot be altered. Um, it can also be used for, for regular publishers uh, to um, prove that they publish something at a certain time uh, and that they haven't deleted it or modified it uh, subsequently. And that can create a scaffold of history of all, you know, everything that appears in the newspaper, what appears on telly, sir, uh, that can be locked down in such a way that new powerful figures can't come back and change uh, that information. And that then removes the incentive for censorship. Because if you can't get away with censorship, uh, a lot of the incentive uh, to actually do it uh, is removed. And that's very, a very powerful thing. In their book, Schmidt and Cohen discuss the future of revolution. But you describe their book as a simplistic fusion of Fukuyama's end of history ideology and faster mobile phones. How do you see the future of revolution and one that moves beyond the boundaries of Google's vision? Unfortunately, it's not surprising that this Fukuyama end of history ideology, um, this American liberal centrism, uh, is part of Google's way of looking at the world. Uh, because Francis Fukuyama is on the board of the New America Foundation. And the New America Foundation, which is Washington DC based think tank, funded principally by Eric Schmidt, uh, but also by the US State Department. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's Eric Schmidt's principal ideological vehicle uh, in the United States. There's about 110 people working for it. Um, so um, that vision for the future, um, I mean, it's a, I, th I think it, it's not intellectually, intellectually it's not interesting. Uh, it, is, it is this really quite banal, um, pro even provincial way of looking at the world. But nonetheless, that is the most, um, that is the most aggressive or in, most effective um, ideology that there is at the moment. I mean, it couples loosely to American neoliberalism, uh, and it is, in fact, the dominant ideology, uh, if we at least exclude the Chinese, um, that the world has. And so I think to, to sort of point, we need to see how um, vacuous uh, and dangerous uh, that ideology is uh, if we are to create effective alternatives to it. Google's meeting with you was presumably to research their own book. How did they end up representing you and WikiLeaks? Well, afterwards, <clears throat> and it's, I described this story in the book, um, it was very interesting to meet uh, Eric Schmidt. We got along quite well, and also with uh, Jerry Cohen. These are not unpersonable people. Um, but later on, it became clear that they immediately reported that meeting to their contacts at the State Department to such a degree that later on, when I needed to speak to Hillary Clinton about uh, cables we were going to publish for legal reasons, just to notify that we were going to do it, um, so there couldn't be an accusation that we hadn't, uh, you know, we called up the State Department and then there was going to be a call back uh, and to verify that, you know, that it really was WikiLeaks contacting the State Department. They were very surprised, of course. Um, and we did get a call back we got a connection back through a back channel established by Hillary's people, and that back channel was Eric Schmitz, the CEO, uh, sorry, the chairman of Google, uh, his girlfriend at the time, Lisa Shields. Uh, she was used as a back channel. She doesn't work for the State Department formally. Uh, she's the 
Director of Communications at the Council for Foreign Relations. So you have Google is literally in bed with the State Department. Literally. Its chief executive, um, chief executive's lover was being used as the back channel from Hillary Clinton uh, to me. And that um, made me very uh, intrigued um, as to exactly who these people were, who had come to see me and what their relationships were and what Google uh, was all about. Now, in the new digital age, uh, uh, there is a, some description and discussion of Google, uh, sorry, of WikiLeaks, um, and it's quite interesting. On the one hand, it, 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 there's some description which is fair uh, and, and high-minded, but then you see something else kicking in. So that might even be, you know, Eric Schmidt as an, an engineer having some rapport with me, uh, and we both don't like censorship by the Chinese, for example. Google doesn't like it on them, we don't like it on us. Um, but uh, then you can see that they clearly believe they cannot say that publicly. They, they can't give a, that view, and I think they probably also don't have that view in, entirely. So they find a need to demonize us and say that, uh, you know, that we're sort of like uh, high-tech terrorists uh, and there needs to be centralized state uh, regulation uh, and pre-vetting of materials that sites like WikiLeaks publish. In your previous book, Cypherpunks, you wrote, the world is not sliding but galloping into a new transnational dystopia. What can be done to pull back on the reins and change the course of history? Yes, that's right. I, um, I wrote that in 2012. Uh, that's still correct. In fact, there's even more significant signs that that is, that that is occurring. Um, it may not be possible to stop it. That's, that's the reality. It may actually not be possible to stop it. But there are some elements of hope, uh, and they're the only game in town. Uh, so if, if we don't want to live in a dystopia, we're going to have to try these, because that's all that, all that there is. Um, we can't simply become neo-Luddites and go back to the cave. Maybe that will protect a couple of people for a little while, but by doing that you pull yourself out of society and you cease uh, to um, adjust its path. Um, so the hopeful signs of these, um, for example, uh, in this standoff with Edward Snowden, uh, the National Security Agency was after him, essentially all of US intelligence was after him once he first became public in Hong Kong. Uh, the US was exerting very significant diplomatic pressure, intelligence pressure, uh, to locate him, pressure the Hong Kong authorities to arrest him and so on. Um, and WikiLeaks and its small team um, decided that uh, we had to stop him being arrested because it would send a very bad signal. Uh, and so we went in to Hong Kong, we engaged in various you know, forms of secret communications to protect our operation to get him asylum, got him out uh, and eventually got him asylum uh, in Russia where he, he's, he's still safe. Uh, now, um, the question is how was that possible? Given the amount of resources, this is the largest intelligence manhunt the world has ever seen, how was that possible that a small publisher, uh, a publisher with some experience in dealing with, with security agencies, but nonetheless, a small publisher would able to defeat the National Security Agency and the US diplomatic establishment in a well-defined, head-on conflict. How is it we were able to do that? It's not because, you know, that, that we're um, uh, so amazing or, or that our, our resources are so huge. Um, we were determined. We used some interesting technology of our own. Uh, but most of all, because the National Security Agency and the U.S. State Department and so on, these are very big bureaucracies. And these big bureaucracies are actually fairly incompetent because they are so big. So, so when you have this um, overreaching state uh, merged with the largest of private industries, uh, it becomes a, you know, a dinosaur in some ways and can, can be outmaneuvered. Um, with some clever ideas and enough will and so on. But those clever ideas that, that we use, they're basically uh, encryption and yes, some political stuff, but um, 
I think small companies, startups, smaller governments uh, working out that they need to deploy encryption technology and understand companies like Google and what their threats are. Uh, it may mean that because of their small size, they can outmaneuver uh, these much larger, slower organizations. And you know, the, the smaller states in Latin America uh, over the last 10 years uh, have actually been doing that to some degree uh, with the US empire. That is, that they've been able to get uh, increase of sovereignty um, um, while the US was becoming much more powerful in its intelligence apparatus. Mind you, um, some of the explanation is the, the US has used that massive intelligence apparatus now principally on the Middle East in the past 10 years. It's taken its eye off the, off the backyard. Uh, so it, it's hard to tell exactly which one of these two uh, factors dominate, but nonetheless it seems to be um, the only hope we have, so we've got to play it. That's it for today's Imaginary Alliance. Thanks for watching the show. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Please join me next week.